Good evening, everyone, and on behalf of the Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown, welcome to the second in a series of panel discussions, Looking in the Mirror, Cooperstown Reflects on Racism, with today's focus, is, focus on tourism, which is central to our area's economy. My name is Leanne Hirabayashi, and I have the distinct privilege of co-moderating these sessions. Looks like we have about... Um, 30 attendees so far, um, and I'll give you an update um, as we go along. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. The uh, series, just a quick little description of this series, it's a response to the murder of George Floyd and the nationwide protests that erupted in support of the Black Lives Movement. The goals of the series are to examine on a local level to examine the impact of racism, learn how to confront bias and inequities, identify actions that individuals, groups, and the community can take to address racism and create a more equitable Cooperstown. We have four sessions this fall. Um, as I said, this is the second one, and then we'll have three to four more in January, February of 2021. Let me go over a few items related to logistics in the format of this online discussion. Uh, there will be a couple of brief messages from the sponsor and hosts of the session um, or of the series as a whole. Then I'll introduce our distinguished panelists. After the introductions, each panelist will make a brief five minute presentation. If there are presentation specific questions from the audience or other panelists, we'll address them right then. Um, then we'll have a question and answer session and and discussion. Um, for attendees, um, the, uh, the black bar at the bottom of your um, uh, Zoom browser window, you will see this uh, something like this. Note that the chat and raise hand feature, the chat is disabled for attendees and the raise hand feature we're not going to be using. We will focus, for, for your um, Inter, uh, engagement and participation, please use the Q&A tool that, that you see there um, and submit your questions throughout the presentation and discussions. Uh, and our um, co-moderator, who I will be introducing shortly, um, will be moderating, uh, monitoring the Q&A tool and she'll ask questions on your behalf. If your question, again, is specific to one of the panelists, please indicate that in your question. Otherwise, we'll assume the question is for everybody. Um, we may not be able to get to everyone's questions, and I appreciate your understanding related to that. And finally, note that these uh, panel discussions are being recorded, and a link to the recording will be made available on the Friends of the Village Library webpage. Now, a brief message from the Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown about our mission, which is to promote cultural literacy and enhance community engagement in the library through advocacy, direct financial contributions to the library um, and uh, fundraising and encouragement of endowment and gifts, as well as educational and recreational programs um, such as this one. And uh, if you need more information, um, you will please go to their um, website, go to the village library of cooperstown.org and just click on the Friends of the Village Library tab. You will find there links to resources uh, and uh, that have been gathered by library staff and volunteers, and also um, will be updated regularly with um, any recommendations by panelists as we go along. The, uh, also, the League of Women Voters of the Cooperstown area is grateful for this opportunity to join the Friends of the Village Library in this panel discussion. The League believes that diversity, equity, and inclusion are central to its current and future success in engaging all individuals, households, communities, and policymakers in creating a more perfect democracy. And we'd like to take this opportunity, speaking of democracy, uh, to remind the audience of important dates related to the upcoming election. Uh, on October 9, that is your last day to register to vote, just coming around uh, shortly. So to, to register, go to the NYS DMV website to register online, or you can download a form to fill out and register in person. Early voting is from October 24 to November 1. That's at the Etsego County Complex, Meadows Complex, and times do vary. Uh, 
um, from day to day. So go to otsigucounty.com for the details. Uh, October 27, that's the last day to apply by mail for an absentee ballot. And then uh, November 2, that's the last day to apply in person for an absentee ballot. Please note that in New York State, you can both, you can get an absentee ballot and, and send that in. And you can also vote in person. And what will happen is that the absentee ballot will be invalidated. But if you're feeling like, yeah, I want to do the absentee ballot, but then you just change your mind and decide you want to vote, you can do that. So um, please note that. And then finally, November 3rd, Election Day, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, and it's also the last day to postmark your absentee ballot or deliver it to a polling place. Um, we also like to point you to vote411.org, which is where you can find um, information about all the statewide elections and local elections uh, that um, you would be voting on. You just enter in where, you, where you're, I think you're, you're entering your zip code or your town and you enter um, your party if that's applicable and it will list all your candidates. So it's a, it's a great um, resource for you. So let me go start with the introductions now. Um, I'd like to introduce Molly Myers, the co-moderator. She is the development associate for Fenner, Fennimore Art Museum and the Farmers Museum. She grew up in Cooperstown, attended Wells College, where she studied women and gender studies and First Nations and Indigenous studies. Uh, she moved back to the area in 2018. She currently serves on the board of the Cooperstown Lions Club and uh, the, is the chair of the Cooperstown Winter Carnival Committee, is on the board of the Cooperstown Chamber of Commerce, and will serve on Otsego County's Law Enforcement Review Force. Uh, in her spare time, she's host of a book club and is a loving mother of two cats. Cassandra Harrington is the executive director of Destination Marketing Corporation, which is a private organization contracted by both Otsego and Schoharie counties of central New York for the purpose of tourism marketing. And its ultimate goal is generating occupancy tax income through overnight stays. She uh, spent a decade working in the Finger Lakes wine industry and then relocated to Cooperstown to lead Destination Marketing Corporation. And in just three years, she's increased private partner investment by 78% and secured the Schoharie County contract in fall 2019. More recently, she uh, led Otsego County's COVID-19 Economic Impact and Recovery Task Force and has reimagined tourism promotion in today's challenging travel climate. And while she's not working, Cassandra likes to keep active by running, rock climbing, motorcycle riding, and practicing yoga. Uh, Dieter Harvey is the engagement strategist at Destination Does Happen. As, con as a consultant, Dieter specializes in organizational learning, supporting clients through facilitated training using self-reflection as a tool to create, retain, and transfer knowledge. Dieter's career has ranged from direct service to management to project development and strategic planning. She is currently employed at United Way of the Mohawk Valley as the Utica Empire State Poverty Reduction Initiative Administrator. Dietra served as chairperson for the City of Utica Civil Service Commission and the Utica Oneida County NAACP. And she continues to serve on multiple boards and committees for local nonprofit and community organizations. Tim Mead is president of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Before joining the Baseball Hall of Fame, Tim spent his entire baseball career with the Los Angeles Angels, including his final 22 years as vice president of communications. In that role, Tim oversaw the, team, the team's media relations, publicity, and broadcasting operations. Immediately before that, Tim served as the Angels' assistant general manager from 94 to 97. He began his career as an intern in the Angels' public relations department in 1980 and remained with the organization until June 2019. Tim was the 2000 recipient of the prestigious Robert Official Award for Public Relations Excellence, which is awarded annually by Major League Baseball to an industry executive who excels in promoting the game. Jim Miles is General Manager, Chief Operating Officer of the Otisaga Resort Hotel in Cooper Inn. Prior to joining the Otisaga in 2012, uh, Jim held leadership positions in hospitality and tourism businesses from Florida to Pennsylvania for 35 years, including Hershey Resorts in Colonial Williamsburg. Jim serves on numerous boards, including the New York State Hospitality Association, Glimmerglass Festival, 
and the Cooperstown Rotary Club, just to name a few. And then finally, Cindy Rodriguez is co-founder of Adirondack Diversity Solutions. She is a human resources consultant with over 10 years of experience and expertise spanning higher education, finance, and business administration. With a master's in public administration from Cornell, Cindy brings a unique lens to Adirondack Diversity Solutions, delivering innovative human resources and community engagement solutions that promote transparency in policy and procedures, communication strategies, and organizational development, all while embracing and embedding diversity, equity, and inclusion into organizational values, culture, policies, and practices. So with that, I'm going to stop my share and give me one moment, please. All right, and we'll go ahead and get started with uh, Cassandra Harrington. Thank you. Um, so hi, everybody. I am the executive director of the Destination Marketing Corporation. Um, we are a private 501c6 nonprofit organization contracted by both Otsego and Schoharie counties to do the tourism promotion. So. Um, it is my team's job to attract visitors to our area to enjoy all things that we have to offer from the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum to Howe Caverns and um, everything in between. So we, um, we have a big, a big job. Many of us know, many people know of our office as this is Cooperstown.com. Um, or Cooperstown on Facebook and in Go Cooperstown on Instagram. Um, and so we, we are in somewhat of a, a challenging situation, I have to say, with regards to this topic in particular, because um, to be able to promote our destination, our, our, um, our predominantly white destination, I think that we can all admit that that's, that's the situation um, where we're at right now, um, it, it, it's a challenge to, to promote, to promote Cooperstown, um, as, as a, 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 an extremely welcoming place. If I were to, to go ahead and try to stage a photo shoot to, um, to show that we have diversity in Cooperstown, I almost have to go out of my way in order to do so. And then if, and then if, I get said photos with 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 full diversity and and invite everybody to Cooperstown. Um, then then when when everybody gets here, do they think that um, you know where 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 are all the people? <laughs> um, uh, so 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 we're in somewhat of a, a situation where we don't want to be um, false advertising, but we want to be welcoming. Um, and so one of the, the one of the things that that we continue to try to do, and we continue to do, is we work with a lot of travel writers. Um, we bring in travel writers and influencers and bloggers into the community, and we write up an itinerary for them and and show them all there is to do in Otsego County. Um, or, you know, just a little bit of a, a taste of it. And then they write about their experience. And we do work with, um, with a diverse crowd of travel writers. And so that is, is one way that we try to go about um, attracting different audiences based on who the writer is and who their audience is. Um, and so, and that's an effort on our end to be able to, to be inclusive. Um, Another thing that has been brought up a couple times and is something that maybe we could consider, especially if and when our budgets become more intact, is to offer some sort of um, sensitivity or diversity training where we um, invite maybe business owners and business managers to come in and go through some sort of training where, um, you know, we, we, we prepare them with language and, um, you know, efforts of inclusion that maybe they hadn't quite thought of because uh, it's never been brought to their attention or, or has never quite um, been something that uh, has been required of them. And then, then our management and owners can pass that information down to the frontline staff. 
Um, there's a lot of turnover in frontline staff, so I think it would be best off to provide that information to the upper management so that they can continue to include that in, in their onboarding, perhaps. Um, you know, one of the, the biggest things is that the frontline hospitality workers are often our ambassadors. They're an extension of our community. So we have to make sure that those that are interacting with the consumers, the visitors most often are aware and, and um, able to be a good reflection of Cooperstown in our community. Um, that too, and I think that there's a lot to be said about um, our history. There's a there's a lot of history here, and, and bringing that to the forefront could certainly help, um, especially the the local perception. Um, we have a significant history, especially in Native American, and just the, all the all the different things that we have going through um, Cooperstown and Otsego County. If if we um, if we brought that more to the forefront, I think that would be that would help in this effort. Um, but uh, I think this is a this is this is one more step in acknowledging that there's work to do and that um, we've got we've um, we've we've we're not starting out from from scratch. We, this is something that we've been working on and continue to work on. And um, I thank all of you for, for getting together so that we can have this open dialogue because uh, this, is, this has been helpful for, for myself as, as a self-assessment, but also I'm sharing this with my team and, and my people, um, the businesses that I represent. So um, that's, that's all I have to say, but thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. So we have uh, two questions that have come in. One I think we can save for the more general conversation later on in the program. It's a little more, more overarching. But one is how many of our travel writers or guests represent minority publications or audiences? I don't know if you could answer that at all. Well, we travel writers is something that we're just kind of getting into. Um, I can say that we have had about a 50% representation of, of white versus non-white um, writers that we've had. And so um, I'd say we're, we're, we're pretty much even there. Um, and we can, always, we can always work on getting more in. Um, it's just a matter of making sure that they're interested in the topics that we had, you know, the attractions that we have and pairing them up with what we have to offer here in Cooperstown and making sure that they have a good time so that they share that with their readers too, but. Great, thank you. Do uh, any of the panelists have any uh, questions um, or comments for Cassandra? Okay. All right. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, let's go on to uh, Tim Mead. Good evening, everyone. I'll uh, be a little brief because I'm kind of the newest member to the, the community and uh, tackling one of the issues, um, certainly in, in tourism, um, trying to get up to speed on a lot of things. Uh, my background obviously living in Orange County or Southern California for the last 51 years and working for a professional uh, sports franchise. Uh, we drew 13 million, or pardon, 13, 3 million people a year uh, since 2003, and that was our audience. So for us, it was selling tickets more than the reach out. Um, have a lot of experience, obviously, in reaching out to you know, diverse media. Uh, but I, I work for an organization where every everybody came to us, particularly when we were playing well. Um, so the tourism aspect is something I'm learning. And being on this distinguished panel, obviously for me, uh, we had a call last week, was, was very intriguing and interesting, and uh, have a great staff at the Hall of Fame and a lot of things that I'm still learning in the process you know, between our internal branding and our external branding. But for me, on the, the, the sensitive subject, but the most important subject, really of, of the two topics in, in racism for us. Um, I've worked in a clubhouse where all I saw was diversity. I lived in an area, San Bernardino, California, where everything was split in schools. So I have a different perspective because coming to Cooperstown is different for me, coming from the outside in, in Orange County and what I see or what I don't see, if you will. So 
where I've had to deal with the Asian community, the black community, the Hispanic community, the Latin community, and uh, I think the common denominator between all of those relationships with players, agents, media, fans, is really civ civility and respect. So as this panel discussion goes on tonight, and I was really uh, intrigued by Dietra last week in our conversation, there is a, a common bond in how we approach things. And, uh, you know, I look at, you know, the self-reflection that Cassandra mentioned earlier, um, you know, I've answered my questions. Uh, I, I've had several conversations since the shutdown. We were closed 102 days and we had, uh, with the hall prior to opening June 26th, we provided a Zoom conference call each week with different folks I've known through the years. And um, one of them was Tony Regans, uh, who's now an executive vice president with Major League Baseball. And Tony is black. We hired him as an intern in marketing years ago. He eventually became our general manager. And for me, having given him assignments to, you know, eventually him telling me what to do was a great uh, turnaround. He's one of my dear friends. But we've had conversations about race and things that he's been through for many, many years. So I'm very comfortable talking about it. Um, I have been. My roommate in college was Gerald Miller, uh, the brother of Reggie and Cheryl Miller. Um, we talked about the things that, that Daryl had faced through the years. So I'm not uncomfortable with that individually, but I also at 62 realize how open I need to be from not just my perspective of having grown up in that environment, but say a 17, a 20 something, a 30 something that works at the Hall of Fame and how they may be uh, treated or reacting to people of color. It's just very important and it's, it's not the outward um, things that, that maybe we think racism is about, but it's the unintended bias when answering a question, when greeting something. Uh, Cassandra and Jim and I had a great breakfast the other day and we were, we were talking about that, how I might receive just a, a, a welcome or a greeting much different than a person of color. And then we have to be mindful of that. So for the Hall of Fame, our approach, and I think Jeff Idelson, my predecessor and good friend, and, and it's a great group. This is a time of learning, a time of learning that, you know, should always be in play and will be for generations to come. But this has to be a turning point in an education, uh, not a time of, of short-term uh, results. It has to be a, a long-term results for us. And in terms of tourism, uh, we're all going through something together. We see the numbers. We know what's happened. Obviously, for us at the Hall of Fame, uh, we lost our two big events. We don't know what the future holds, but I think we're approaching it very optimistically. Uh, I think we're working hard. Not think we're working hard. I know we're working hard on external programs uh, as much as, as we can, and, and it's outreach. And I think right now, more than ever before, we can't let inhibitions or our, our realities um, dictate our future. Uh, yeah, it's tough. But I'm, when I've been asked by the media or I went back to Southern California, well, how tough is it? What's going on? And my answer is no different than any place else for the most part across this country. Whether you're, you're a billion dollar organization, which I came from, or a multi-million dollar organization or a nonprofit, or a hotel or whatever you're doing, it's a struggle for everybody. So I don't think that differentiates us. And if anything, we finally have a, you know, we have a couple common goals ultimately on this, uh, this chat tonight. And I, I hope that it's as productive as our conversation was last week and that everybody that's participating in this call takes something away from it. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, are there any questions specifically for uh, Tim, Molly, on the, uh, on the Q&A at this point? Uh, nope, one more question came in, but again, I think that would be best held for a little later. Um, hang on, one more came in just now. Let me just double check what it says. Okay, here's one that could be um, for Tim. Uh, baseball seems like a natural draw to attract a wonderfully diverse crowd the history of Negro Leagues, great black ball players, et cetera. Is there or might there be a permanent exhibition and or video series at the Hall of Fame to feature black, brown, and Asian baseball greats slash fans, et cetera, to inspire and connect with a diverse audience? 
Well, we have an exhibit that's been in place, and that's a great question, so thank you. Uh, Pride and Passion that's been in place for uh, since 1997. Um, in fact, we had a meeting today. It's, it's a project that's an, an exhibit that's probably going to be updated uh, either at the end of next year or 2022. Uh, we're working on that as we speak. La Vida Baseball. If you go through the Hall of Fame, it is a, um, it's a history lesson, certainly in inequality, integration, Jackie Robinson, uh, 1947, then suddenly how baseball has advanced. But it's also a story to be told about women. You know, when we talk about diversity, you know, I know the, folk, the question was about the Negro Leagues, but it's really about diversity. The one great thing about the Hall of Fame is it's told that story, whether it be in the museum, in the library, in our artifacts, and really in our education system as well. So we do dictate, we honor uh, some of the Negro League greats. Uh, it's ongoing uh, discussions of how we evolve. But I think the story for us, it's not telling a new story, it's enhancing an existing story. Uh, as much as anything, we have a great relationship with the Jackie Robinson Foundation, Bob Kendrick with the Negro Leagues Museum in Kansas City. And I think we all have a responsibility to tell tell the story uh, of the Negro Leagues uh, and prior to the Negro Leagues. You know, we focus just on, on Kansas City a little bit, but there are great players in 2006, 17 former members of the Negro Leagues uh, were inducted in the Hall of Fame because there was a special uh, committee put together to examine the statistics and the history. And uh, I think some injustices, if you will, for a period of time were righted and uh, we continue to keep an open mind uh, for new statistics, new presentations from players of that, that generation to continue to be honored in the Hall of Fame. Thank you. Um, one other question came in. Um, it's directed at Tim, but I kind of think it would be best to hold that one off and again, open it up uh, for more people to discuss later on. Um, so I think that would be the best way to move forward with that one. Okay, thank you, Molly. Does anybody have a question or uh, any of the panelists have a specific question for Tim at this point? All right, then let's go ahead and uh, Dieter, why don't you um, take us on to the next step here? Certainly. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity to be able to share some time with you to uh, talk about this very important topic. Um, that has been with me all of my life. So I uh, applaud your efforts and uh, thank you so much for being brave and courageous to have these kinds of conversations because they are not easy. Uh, tonight, what I really wanted to share with you is um, my own personal um, experience uh, being a, a black, for some people, African-American is, you know, the language and I'm, I'm okay with either. Um, but my experience as a black person coming into Cooperstown. For me, I think hospitality and tourism is really important and we all have our thing that we love. And when you set your mind to go to a destination, you are looking forward to something. So your journey actually starts before you get there because your imagination just runs wild and you're just making your plans and you're so excited. You just want to be there. So my first experience with Cooperstown was as a child um, going to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Now, my mother was an avid baseball fan. We grew up in the projects. You walked through the front door, television was on. It was the only television and no one in the house had any play, any say when there was a baseball game on. So, you know, like baseball, baseball, baseball. So when we got to go for that visit, it was very special, it was very unique. It was a, you know, something that many people in my community didn't have an opportunity to do. So my sister and I could share that story and share that experience and it stayed with me all of my life. Fast forward a few years, um, I am now the president of the Utica United County branch in AACP. And there was an incident in Cooperstown. Um, it was a legal matter and we were called in for assistance. And I uh, drove into town as a passenger. I was with my legal redress counsel. And we were driving in to be a support, you know, in the situation to have this conversation. And what I witnessed as we drove into the town took my breath away. 
I immediately was just terrified and wanted to get out of that town as fast as I could. But we couldn't, we had an obligation to have this conversation. And the conversation went very well. When we exited uh, the building on our way to go home, we were stopped by the police and literally questioned in ways that is unacceptable. And I'm like this. You know, and my, and, and my legal redress chair is like, don't say a word, Detroit, you know, and I really want to respond and I'm terrified. I don't know what's going to happen. And long story short, he literally tracked us when we got into town. He, he knew our every move, our left turn, our right turn. So he was just watching. I can't tell you how relieved I was to get home. That is yet another experience that challenges me right, as I go into um, that community. So we all go uh, forward with our everyday life, you know, in our tourism destinations with our own history. So when I walk into a town, I'm, I'm walking in as a, as a black person and all of what that means. So for me, I'm having a very visceral experience in a way that you would not, right? Everything about my past, about my future, you know, about my need to feel like I need to have 12 eyes instead of two. Um, all of that is happening rapid fire, right? Which really kind of diminishes, you know, this great experience that I want to have. So Cooperstown is a place uh, that we visit, you know, uh, organization that I belong to. We have our board retreats there at the Saga. I now have a really good Cooperstown experience, right? And I hold on to that. Well, the first couple of years, we just went to the Otisaga. That's where we stayed. I felt safe there. The third time, you know, we had that visit, we literally traveled and went downtown and shopped. And I have great things in my closet that I love to wear, which is yet again feeding, you know, you know the good feeling about Cooper's. So now I got some good things to remember. That's helping to balance that fear that still remains. I can't say 100% that that's gone. It isn't. But I am adding, you know, new things, you're creating new experiences in my brain, right, to settle my heart so that I can feel comfortable with being in that space. And all that to say is that when you are looking to create a welcoming community, keep in mind that people of color are coming in with so much history and a past, you know, and tags you know, and shadows that you just don't think about, but they're there and we're having this conversation and we're smiling and you would never think, oh my God, you're just thinking a hundred things right now. She's, she's looking directly at me, but literally her eyes are back here, right? Every, every interaction is magnified because you know that as a black person, you're expecting and hoping for a good interaction. But in reality, if it doesn't happen, you're not surprised and then you're just annoyed. Right? I just can't go in and just, and just be. So when we're looking for these new ways to engage communities of color, it can't be standard and ordinary and, all, and you shouldn't ignore all that. You have to use the tools that you have. But it really is about that self-respect that Tim talked about. How do, how do you create that, that community where customer service is top notch, you know, like we're Disney. You know, like we give the best, we deliver the best. That's what you want, you know, but you want that feeling throughout your community. And that is something that you cannot control across the board 100%. In your sphere of where you are, where you have employees, you have staff, you can do training. That's the environment that you can have control over, but you don't have control over the entire community. It takes a, a, a huge community cultural shift so some of that good work that is happening in this pocket and that pocket, you would hope that it trickles down. So that senior person, Tim, in your organization who's now mentoring or influencing that 17 year old, you want to see, you know, good, positive, you know, outcomes, but you can't control everything. And that makes it a little bit frustrating because you just feel like, oh, we're not getting, you know, we're not getting there. And while you're doing all that work, you know, creating those efforts to create this welcoming environment, there's a DITRA, times 100,000, you know, to 5,000, who's literally making a decision. And the first thing I'm thinking about is safety. 
I'm not really thinking about fun first. I'm thinking about safety. Am I going to feel safe there? Am I going to be welcome there? You know, is it going to be worth the money that I'm going to spend <laughs> to be there? At, at, you know, there's money attached. There's your time attached. You don't get your money back. You don't get your time back. So all these things are valuable to me. So I have to weight that and say, am I going to, you know, spend that, you know, time and money here? Or am I going to spend my time and money over here? And one of the things that I'm going to consider first is where do I feel safe? And where do I feel welcome? It's a challenging thing to consider that we got to get, you know, to that level. But all the training in the world is not going to be the 100% answer. But, you know, if we, you know, through these conversations, through self-reflection, through self-accountability, uh, literally kind of pass that on and hold people accountable when you see something that isn't, like I say, call a thing a thing, right? It's easy to say, but if it means that your relationship is going to fall apart, what are you going to do? So you let the behavior pass because you're trying to protect relationship. There's so many layers that influence what addressing racism looks like. And I think that we are addressing it as a high level when really, if we don't get down to the root cause at the lower level, you know, those everyday basic things that you just shouldn't take for granted, like common decency, then we still will miss the mark. Absolutely. That's a really good point, Dietra. Um, one question from the audience um, was just a specific part about the beginning of what you were saying. Um, they said, what was it that terrified Dietra upon her arrival to Cooperstown before her encounter with the police? Um, what specifically made her feel unsafe when she got to town? So as we were driving, so, so the incident was you had two teenagers involved in there. It was a shooting, right? A black, uh, a black child and a white child and uh, the black child was the victim, right? When we drove into the city, it was like a political campaign. Lawn signs, literally red and blue. It, never mind Republican and Democrat, right? And I was like, is it an election? I was like lost for a second. Is it an election time? Is you know, election happening here? But when I read the signs, it was the names of the children, right? We support this child and we support that child. And I can tell you, in that town, the support of the black child, I could see maybe a blue sign over there, maybe over there, but it was like a sea of red. And it was the most horrifying thing because I'm thinking these are kids, you know, their lives, you know, have just totally changed. We don't know what's going to happen, you know, to the perpetrator. We don't know what's, you know, happening with the, with the victim. It was just so many things that needed to be addressed. But what was real was that that black child in that community had minimal support, minimal, like near zero. And I was like, how, how, do we, how do we really address this? How do we support this family through this very difficult time? So as an African-American driving into the community, visiting the community, you can imagine, right? All those people aren't gone away. They're just not gone away. I, I don't know who's who, nor do I, I really want to have the weight of doing this all the time, wondering and guessing. I just want to say, hello, how are you? Have a great day. I just want to be Detroit. I just want to relax, but I'm not so sure. And that is true in many communities across the country. But this happens to be in a community that's right down the road from where I am, that has so many great things to offer, and I hesitate to go. That should not be in any community. Absolutely. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, there is just a, co a couple comments saying that they people think you made some really good points in there um, about trickling down the importance of one bad experience can really shake someone um, and, and be hard to recover from. Um, and then there's a couple of questions in here specifically about um, law enforcement. And I just want to let everybody know that there's going to be actually a different panel specifically about law enforcement, um, similar to this panel, uh, and that's going to be in January or February. So I think we should stay tuned for that, for questions about that topic um, for that panel. Okay, Dietra, thank you very much. Do any of the um, panelists uh, have a specific question for um, Dietra? 
Okay. Dieter, thank you very much. Uh, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> First, I, I want to thank uh, Dieter for being a guest of ours at the Otisaga, and we certainly want to make sure you are welcomed and certainly continue to feel safe whenever you're here. We appreciate that, and we appreciate your group's business as well. Uh, I've been in the resort business over 50 years, and I've worked uh, from Maine to Florida and worked my way back up uh, here to central New York. Uh, and I've worked uh, all in resorts, all in independent properties, all with a very diverse workforce. Probably not in Maine, that would probably be a fair statement. But in Virginia, over well over half of my staff was African American and Florida, similarly so. Uh, Hershey was more of a mixed bag of uh, ethnicity. Uh, and Cooperstown is probably the least diverse outside of Maine that I have worked in. Um, the, uh, I thought one way to, to take a look at this is, is what's the makeup of the staff here and what's the makeup of our guests? Not that we're 100% uh, uh, representative of all the tourism business in the greater Cooperstown area, but we, we certainly have a piece of that. Um, because what does that look like and how does that attract or repel other people uh, that are maybe looking for people that look like them? So back in, um, it's an interesting change. For in 2012 at the Otisaga, we had about 265 people working here. And at that time we had zero Hispanic and Latino. We had two African American. We had three Asian and we had 260 Caucasian. Those are the numbers that we have to supply to the government, as you know. Move up to 2019, the last year that we've had to submit data, and we had seven Hispanic Latino, 27 African American, 50 Asian, and only 199 Caucasian. So we dropped that uh, category by 30%. We increased African American and Asian by over 1,200%. Um, how did we do that in that period of time? The biggest answer is international workforce. Uh, as most businesses in Cooperstown will tell you, finding staff is a daily challenge. Um, and we welcome anyone that would like to work. Uh, but we had to go to uh, Eastern Europe um, and uh, further abroad, as well as uh, getting J-1 visas, which are college students generally. And we had to bring in over 25 H-2B visa workers. Uh, all of ours came from Jamaica. That increased our numbers significantly. And the second way is that we, we recruit and go to colleges, uh, uh, job fairs all through New York State and outside of the state. And obviously the people that are applying for there, the makeup of the college or the trade school or the job fair is a reflection of then becomes the, what our workforce tends to look like. So we've got a couple of ways to go in. Are we happy with that percentage? I'd, I'd like to see growth uh, in several of the categories. Um, I'd like to see overall growth because we could use 200 more people working here over what we have currently, though this year is a little bit of an exception. So, all right, that's what our workforce looks like. What, what about, what are the guests uh, that come to the Otisaga look like? And we, we track a lot of information over a lot of years. The, uh, the largest market segment for us, and it's probably true for the greater uh, Cooperstown area, Tim would have a little bit broader audience uh, than this, but the largest market is uh, New Jersey, New York City, and Long Island. And that's been the case for the oh, probably the last 15 or 18 years that, that we've been tracking this. It does not change. By state, the top markets of people, and, and I say this so you'd be thinking of the diversity of these states. New York is the biggest market. Um, for everyone here in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. So those have diversity of, of all types and kinds in those states. Not that we're seeing all of them here. For us at the Orisaga, 68% of the social business that we do is, uh, it comes from a 250 mile radius. We're a drive market, you all know that. The closest airport is in Albany or Syracuse. Uh, most people coming to Cooperstown are driving. As you also know, we don't have public transportation. It's pretty expensive to get a limo or a cab, uh, in, in, a Uber if you can even get it, from Albany Airport to come to Cooperstown. Uh, just doesn't happen. The train doesn't stop anywhere close to us. You can get the bus from the West Side Station and uh, get dropped off uh, down by New York Pizzeria, 
and then walk to wherever you're going. I think the only time we have Uber in Cooperstown is during a Hall of Fame induction. Thank you for that, Tim. Uh, but uh, there isn't any public transportation. That is an impact on also what we're talking about. But 68% of our people drive in from a 250 mile radius. Well, where does that cover? Well, north of us, 250 miles will get you to Ottawa and Montreal. They don't have a baseball team any longer, but that's okay, Tim. South of us is Delaware. Uh, east is Maine, Boston, and of course the ocean. And West gets us over to about just about Pittsburgh. So that's a bulk of the traffic that's coming here uh, for us. And I think that's probably true for a lot of our, uh, our uh, other properties, lodging properties in the area. What about age? Now this is probably a little different for us uh, than some of the other properties, but 52% of the people that we have stay with us are 56 years old or older. And 26% of our guests are between the ages of 46 and 55. So 78% of the people staying in our hotel are 46 years and older. Uh, I think that has also ramifications on diversity, interests of people, et cetera. We're obviously not attracting the millennials right at the moment uh, here. That's, that'd be a fair, fair statement. So uh, how do we change that if we wanted to change that? How do we, how do we make a, a move into different segments? And I, I sort of equate it to uh, if going after a different group segment, it can be groups, it can be people. When I talk groups, I mean like meetings type of thing. But it's the same between that and I think trying to find another group people. Um, what market segment do you want to go after? Who do you want to attract here? And then find out where they're currently going. As Deidre said, there are places where she feels very comfortable, she likes to go. Where are those and why? And then what do those places have that we don't, that we can add or adjust or tweak or uh, puff up our, our advantages that others might not have? Fine, then we got to get buy-in, and this, Dietra took the words right out of my mouth. You, it's not just us doing it. We've got to get buy-in from the county. We've got to get buy-in from New York State Department of Tourism uh, in order to facilitate this, because it is a long process. If we decided we wanted to go after uh, timber jacks uh, as a group, for instance, and we found out where they have meetings and chapters, et cetera, and then we meet with them, we talk to them, we bring some in, we find uh, bloggers, influencers, uh, fam trips, that's a familiarization trip where we invite people to come and see our wares and hope that they go back and tell positive stories to other people. Those are years in the making to do that before you get your first nib or bite from a group. And I think it works similarly with people. Um, you've got to have a critical mass. You've got to have more than just one or two. Certainly if that's been my experience, uh, even in recruiting diversified, even uh, executives and senior people, if they're the only one in the community, they'll tell you they love the job, but they don't feel comfortable. Um, it's just, it just doesn't feel good for them. So doing that, this type of work not only takes years, it takes resources, it takes money, it takes time, it takes somebody that's aggressively spearheading the operation. And as Deidre said, uh, you can get one or two doing it right and only takes one or two others to mess it up for everyone else. You've got to get buy-in on a much bigger stage and whether that's people, whether that's segments of the meetings business, whatever it is, uh, you've got to find ways to do that. In some cases, uh, when we were attracting in another property I worked at and a uh, Japanese uh, market segment, uh, we had to put sushi on the breakfast menu that didn't necessarily appeal to a lot of our regular clientele, but that's something you do to make people feel comfortable, uh, feel at home. Um, it could be menus, it can be amenities, it can be language. Do you have people on the staff that can speak other languages? Um, we certainly did when we brought in our Eastern Europeans. We had, a, we had the United Nations in our cafeteria every day. I mean, it was a wonderful thing. Um, we had our Jamaicans cook uh, several meals during the course of the summer for the, uh, the rest of our staff to show uh, Jamaican cuisine. Uh, and it was a real, always a big hit. I mentioned to the chef today, it's time to do another one of those because they really make some great jerk chicken and it's a lot of fun and uh, everyone really gets into it. So it's sort of exploring other people's cultures, what makes us the same as Tim said, what makes us different, but in a very positive, friendly, helpful way. If you can do it in that 
instant, if you can do it in that group, in that setting, though it's not large, uh, you need to expand upon it. And that's where it gets much more difficult. We certainly welcome anyone and everyone here. Um, God knows we can use all of them that we can find. And the same way for staff, both are very, very necessary for us. And yes, we can do diversity training, we can do culture training, we can do all of that type of thing. Um, but we've got to get the people here, we've got to get them to come back, they've got to tell their friends, and we have to build a community of trust and welcoming uh, for those people. So that, um, as Deidre said, she's had several good experiences after a horrific first experience. And uh, we don't always get a chance for a second time. So very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So there's a couple questions that I think um, relate to what Jim was talking about. Um, one is, do you have data on ethnicity for visitors and is that appropriate or practical to collect? Great question, uh, because if I had it, I would have given that out. The, the data <laughs> that I gave you on uh, age, and we also track income and where they're from, uh, is basically self-reported. Um, we, we survey all of our guests and there's, you know, at the end of the survey, you've all taken them, there's 28 questions and, you know, either people put that they make $3 million a year, or they, they make a thousand, you, you have to go with whatever they say. So there's a little bit of whatever with it, but we do not ask a race question. We do not ask what their uh, ethnicity is. Um, in matter of fact, I've not really seen that on general hotel surveys. Um, location and all of that, that comes just from registration. So that's hard data that we have. Um, so uh, I, I don't have the data, we don't collect that data. I could tell you anecdotally, that the vast majority of our guests are Caucasian. I mean, that's not gonna come as any great shock to anyone here, I don't think. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is more about, um, there's two here that I think I can summarize sort of into one question, uh, more about your staff and when you have, um, let's see, do you inquire of your foreign workers about their experience while living in and participating in the Cooperstown community? Um, and also sort of related, have you or your staff witnessed racism towards your employees from Jamaica by either guests or other employees? They're great questions. Um, the, uh, the first part, we, we, because we're the parents, particularly of the J1s who are college kids, we sort of are mom and dad uh, to all of them uh, for a number of things, for everything from uh, necessities and needs to medical treatment, et cetera. So yes, they're very free with their feedback um, on what's happening. For most of them, probably 95% of the J1s, this is their first time in the United States. So a lot of it is what they know America from uh, movies, uh, and uh, it's not exactly quite the same thing uh, as, as all of us know. Uh, the streets aren't paved <laughs> with gold and the stores aren't open 24 hours a day. So. Uh, we, we, we try to uh, tone down some expectations that they may have. Uh, I say most of them are very happy and enjoy it. They, they all have decent English skills, uh, which we interview for, at least enough to be able to do the job. Uh, we enjoy also listening to them in their native tongue talk. Uh, I'd say that uh, I'm sure there are incidences, sometimes it's just with between different countries uh, it's not even outside uh, the borders of where we have them staying. Um, and sometimes it is in the community. Our, our Jamaicans, uh, we've been very fortunate uh, up until this year when there are no visas to be had, that we've had basically the same group come for the last three years. And so they're great, wonderful, uh, fun loving, warm, great people. And the very first time we picked them up in Albany and it was uh, the, uh, just around the 1st of April, and it was a typical April. There was snow on the ground and it was cold and they were all coming off the plane in flip-flops. And I knew this was gonna be good. And uh, when we got them to where they were staying, they had never seen snow before. Uh, so they're out there in their flip-flops in the snow banks, taking pictures to send home to their, their other spouse or their kids, because most of them were married. Uh, some of them did experience some pushback from, uh, we rented homes to, uh, to uh, house a lot of these people. And I'm not sure everyone was quite willing to accept them as we were. However, 
that may was at the beginning. At the end, many of the people said to us that they were the nicest group of people. They were helpful. They were friendly. It was wonderful. And we never had another incident um, after that. But yeah, I think people were a little concerned, a little worried. It was different. They didn't look like them. They weren't sure what was going to happen. Uh, and nothing did. Uh, so uh, it was, it was, it was good, but I could see, I could see a little strain. Yes. Great. Thank you. I think the other questions will hold off um, for later on. So thank you so much. Okay. And uh, panelists, any uh, specific questions for Jim on his presentation? Okay. All right. Cindy, uh, last but certainly not least. Thank you. Um, so my name is Cindy Rodriguez. I am the co-founder of Adirondack Diversity Solutions. Um, we are a human resources consulting firm that help organizations from the industries of tourism to higher education um, to nonprofits um, really look for long-term sustainable practices where we promote, engage, and embed diversity, equity, inclusion, and access um, into the organization's culture. Um, and so like a lot of my colleagues have shared before um, on this panel, um, you know, it's really about um, thinking about long term sustained um, strategies uh, and not these prescriptive, you know, one time in and out and that's it. We're done. We've checked our box and we're good. Right. Um, we focus on helping organizations create diversity and inclusion specific strategic plans. Um, we also help with climate surveys um, because we believe um, that it starts at home. Um, so it's really taking a look, good look internally at our organizations and um, identifying um, what our um, workforce looks like, what, what, what ethnicities, race, what diversity is represented within our workforce, but more importantly, what is it and why. Um, we also work with organizations to evaluate their policies, procedures, um, to mitigate barriers to access and success, um, and also create recruiting and retention strategies. Um, a lot of our work um, has been in the Adirondacks, um, which is, uh, I always get the, the question, you know, why the Adirondacks? Um, I grew up in Colorado. Um, so I grew up with the Rockies, so I was naturally attracted to the Adirondacks when we moved to um, uh, upstate New York. Um, and it didn't take long. Um, it was actually my first trip to the Adirondacks and probably within the first couple of hours that I realized that I was going to be the only person of color around. Um, and, um, you know, going through Lake Placid, uh, all the really cute shops, um, and uh, again, right, seeing images and um, marketing campaigns that really didn't cater to me. Um, and so I thought, okay, well, this is interesting. Um, and as we all know, um, bad news travels fast. Um, unfortunately, this was something that um, I experienced personally as well. Um, when um, we stayed at a hotel um, that had a marketing campaign for weddings. Um, at the time, my fiance and I were engaged and we're looking for uh, wedding venues. And um, uh, we stepped into the elevator and there was an image of a biracial couple. Um, the uh, the um, uh, person who uh, was portrayed as the groom um, was African, is African-American. Um, and um, their face had been scratched off on the billboard, on the image in the elevator. And so immediately that was something that raised red flags. Um, and so it's these, experience, these experiences that really cause red flag, that cause for a pause, that really have to be addressed right then and there. Um, but we have to understand that our destinations are communities first, and we have to understand that the work starts at home too. Um, so while we do work with workforce um, and organizations, we also work with communities. Um, we try to engage communities and our organizations so that we can have that buy-in um, as some of our other panelists talked um, and really understanding that this is um, a collaboration. Um, it's sometimes working with a series of different um, nonprofits and um, marketing destination companies, um, as well as um, attractions. Um, and then also uh, local um, 
community centers um, to ensure that we're having these conversations at every level, not just in our workplace and or not just in our com in our community centers, right? Um, so it really takes a village. And so that is actually our strategy um, for uh, sustainable um, strategies, long-term sustainable strategies um, to really help and promote, engage, and embed um, diversity, equity, and inclusion into um, not only organizational cultures, um, but also, um, as you mentioned, um, the community culture. Thank you very much, Cindy. Um, are there uh, questions specifically for Cindy from the audience, Molly? Um, I don't think any are specifically for Cindy. Okay, um, great. I think everything she said was awesome, though. <laughs> 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 Yes, that's great. Um, so why don't we open up the uh, discussion uh, to let's let's go ahead and start having a, a discussion and answering some of the general questions. Um, I I'm I'm just going to start off um, and ask you uh, each one of you if you can. I, this is kind of a big question, but if you can answer it um, fairly fairly briefly, um, what do you see as um, this sort of the one or two strengths and weaknesses of um, your organization that can help uh, address racism or are hindering your organization from addressing racism? So um, why don't I start off with Cassandra since you haven't had a chance to to talk for a little while. Um, things that we can do to help, like I said, we can, we can, um, I think, I think our, our organization is probably best suited to be able to host or facilitate some type of training, maybe if it was working with Detroit or Cindy's organizations, uh, to be able to offer that to the community, either in the business community or the general community at large. Um, and to to continue to to project a welcoming message to people of all races and ethnicities and genders and um, in, in in all of our marketing and we have plenty of different avenues of marketing. We've got our website and social media and printed materials and and digital ads. So we and and we do those in targeted markets too. Um, so we have. We have the resources to be able to communicate with people directly. Um, I think those are certain things that, that we can work on. Um, and I, I have to been looking at some of the questions coming in. Uh, there has been talk to about potential expansion of, of um, accessibility and transportation and trying to get people here. We have run into quite a few snags with that. I know that we were working on hopefully trying to get some public transportation between the Albany transportation centers, whether it be the airport or the bus station to be able to bring folks here. But it's a it's one of those things that either costs a lot of money and you'd have to have a ton of immediate buy in in order to get to fund it to be able to get that to be sustainable or um, public term we ran into a snag with public transportation being funded by certain by the specific county that it provides services to and then cannot leave that county because it's funded by um, so crossing county lines was the snag that we ran into um, and, and so I know too that that's one of the biggest challenges I think that that we're facing is that um, being a, a strong drive market and knowing that we don't have a, a train a train you know an Amtrak station nearby um, that that's certainly one of one of our challenges in in accessibility. Great, thank you, um, and Tim. What about your organization about the Hall of Fame? Um, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses uh, that can either help or hinder addressing racism? I think for the strength, it's really the history of the game itself and the fact that the institution, is, as I alluded to earlier, has told the story of racism, exclusion, if you will, a uh, story not just about integration, segregation, Jackie Robinson, um, but Hispanics uh, and, and Latin players as well. So I think we have a coverage 
of a historical perspective, not just in artifacts that you can see in the museum, but the education system. You know, we have a tremendous library that researchers from across the country, Sabre uh, members, um, you know, members of the media come for uh, work on their books and tell the story as well. And obviously I know that, you know, the hall draws the, the biggest, uh, you know, spectrum of folks from around the country. So I think that so many people involved are working on those projects throughout the course of the season. There's, a, there's certainly that natural progression of awareness. What can we do? I don't know that it's necessarily a weakness. I think it's just, it's more of an awareness. I, I'm, you know, personally just don't happen to believe that you can legislate all the things that we need to do. And as I think alluded earlier, it's going to come from within eventually. And I'm, I'm very much the, the believer in, you know, you throw the pebble in the creek and it's not the one stone, but it's the, you know, the ripple effect of, of, of that, um, you know, what do you call it? But after you throw the uh, the rock in the creek, how far that goes out? And I think we have to extend it in the conversation. We we just uh, we had a conversation yesterday that we've created a DEAI program with diversity and equality within the organization. And the conversation is going to be that we're going to go across the spectrum. We're going to uh, the diversity of people of color, women, ADA, everything. So that part of it, I think, if you can create an environment. You know, our, our, it's important that we have the public outreach. We all agree to that. But there's days that we may, in good times, have 1,200 to 2,400 people come through the hall on a given day. And in the, you know, the, the center of the winter, we may have 100, 110. We have to live it every day. Um, that's, the, that's the important thing. You have to get people comfortable. Um, you know, and I think it's much different talking politics than talk, talking issues. Uh, and I would just give you an example of that. And, and I've seen it happen. Uh, one of my dear friends is Albert Pujols and his wife Deirdre. And she went to Major League Baseball a few years ago. It's probably been five years ago now. And wanted to start a campaign called Strike Out Slavery. Well, as soon as you said slavery, I mean, obviously that sends people in a, in a different, you know, mode. But her point was, was with Strike Out Slavery was about human trafficking. And she's made it a, a, a strong case. She's gone to Mexico, Brazil, she's gone undercover. She's gotten involved. So she hasn't just used her husband's status or money. She's actually gotten involved. Well, some folks, and she came to the Angels and we were the first club to do it. Some folks were uncomfortable having something in a, in a public setting where the family's setting. And then you put out support Albert Pujols. We had events, strike out slave, and you throw it on the scoreboard. And it made some people uneasy because they said, you know, you, you come to a ball game to get away from those things. And Deidre's point back was, when, when are you going to escape? We talk about issues. There's never a, a good time to talk about tough issues. Now I think there's four or five clubs involved in it. She's had meetings in the White House and state and local government. Her campaign, because she started something that, she, that a lot of people were, were hesitant about becoming involved in because it just had a tough connotation and she pushed it along. She forced some dialogue with some people that were initially uncomfortable. Now they're some of her biggest supporters. So I think getting back to my point with the hall is you have to break down your internal barriers mm -hmm. before you can possibly, to me, before you can possibly grow externally. Otherwise it just looks contrived. All these things that we're talking about across the country, you have to feel it. You just, you, you just have to feel it and you have to be able to do it. Today is Wednesday. I practiced it Wednesday. I'm going to live it Thursday and beyond. And I think that's what we have to instill collectively in any organization, you know, whether it's the Hall of Fame, the Fenimore, any place. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, Tim? <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Uh, Jim, what about you for your organization, uh, for the Otisaga? You know, what do you see as the strengths and weaknesses um, that you think can help and, and hinder addressing racism? I'm not sure I can top anything that my colleague, Mr. Mead, had to say, but uh, the, uh, I, I think strengths are that we're very much interested as a business, uh, and we're in the hospitality business. We welcome people every day. And so that part we have, it's, it's finding more people uh, of all types that uh, we want to do, and we have resources to do that. 
But I think that the weakness is, as we've talked about, we can be doing it, but we've got to have Main Street in Cooperstown as part of that. We've got to have the outlying community as part of that, or it's going to be once and done. It does start at home. It does start with yourself. Um, we have to get our people engaged, and they're not all going to be engaged initially because they're dealing with a 98% Caucasian market. So they've got to learn, um, particularly those that have grown up here, um, that there are other things happening. And uh, we certainly are willing to put resources to support that, but we've got to get other buy-in. So, I mean, it's, we can be a, a player, a leader, a, a motivator, a helper, um, but we have to get an organizational group together to, uh, to spread this um, further. And it, and it won't happen overnight, as, as we all know. Okay. Thank you, um, Deitra. Your your organization. Uh, what? So, I'm kind of looking to Cindy and and Deitra here. As so, you, what what would you your organization offer to um, Cooperstown uh, organizations and the community to address racism? What specifically? What kinds of things do, could you see your organization being able to offer? And we'll start with Dieter. So for me, as a um, consultant, um, this is where I believe we have huge gaps. There are many people who have huge responsibilities. Some of you are right here on this panel. The expectation is that you're going to get it all and then you're going to funnel it down. But who's there for you, right? I think that what I bring to the table is this um, consultant, coach, friend, that you can just have that real, raw, private conversation with, right? The thing that you need to help you to be better so that when you go out to your company, go out to your employees, at least you've addressed yourself in a very authentic, safe way. There isn't a real platform for our CEOs or heads of companies just to be able to have that real raw conversation, like Dietra, what do you think? You know, Dietra, I saw that. Dietra, I said this. And just really be able to have that kind of engagement. There's no right, wrong, but people still need to have a place to talk about it, right? Without the expectation of having to go out in the world to be the expert themselves, right? We don't give our folks who are responsible for others and to others the opportunity to kind of ramp up to kind of address it from within. We all get the same kind of training, but who's there? So what I bring to the table is that consultant, coach, friend, that you can have that conversation with to help you ramp up to get your company in shape. And if we wanna take it a step further, and I think most companies desire to do this, what does that unique plan look like for you? How do we create it to meet today? How do we create it agile enough so that you can flow to your tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So that's what I could bring to the table. Thank you, Deja. Uh, what about you, Cindy? What do you see your, or what could your organization offer to, you know, whether it's the Cooperstown community as a whole or, or to organizations uh, in, in Cooperstown to address racism? Um, well, this quickly turned into a job interview. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, um, I think for me, um, probably the best thing I could do is give you an example of some of the work that we've done. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of our work is in the, in the Adirondacks, um, which similar to Cooperstown is about 93% percent, percent, plus Caucasian in residency and about 92% percent plus percent Caucasian in visitorship. So we're missing a lot of individuals, right? We're, we're missing a lot of markets. Um, that said, we've partnered with fantastic organizations like the Adirondack Experience, um, which is a museum located in Blue Mountain Lake, um, to create some really long lasting strategic initiatives from recruitment and retention through the creation of an internship program where we brought in um, students from underserved communities um, with the Museum Diversity Fellowship Program uh, with the assistance of a NISCA grant, New York State Council of the Arts grant. Um, and really the internship was intended to be, yes, a recruitment tool in terms of a pipeline, a talent pipeline, but it was also meant to have a community engagement piece. 
Um, so what we did was um, we interviewed all of our students um, when they arrived, we engaged them in their interests, and then we um, connected them with community leaders. Um, and we went out and visited the community leaders um, in their hometowns. Um, so organizations like um, the Adirondack Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization, um, hosted our interns um, in Lake Placid. Um, as well as um, DEC um, actually provided a first time camping experience um, for our interns. And um, it was a fantastic camping weekend. They got a chance to meet um, the park ranger. And so I think it's really beyond thinking of these work experiences, thinking of our workforce and really starting to think about how um, our youth, how our um, workforce contributes to our community, but how they're also a community, right? And how they engage with the community. And so um, it was a fantastic experience. It was a fantastic compensation package that we were able to provide as well. So we also, um, thanks for the grant, thanks to the grant, um, we were able to provide a very attractive um, compensation package. We were able to fundraise. Um, and then, you know, in the Adirondacks, we also don't have public transportation. Um, so access is a big thing. Um, we were also very fortunate to work with partners to create uh, shuttles. So um, once or twice a week, we had grocery runs. Um, if the fellows needed a doctor's appointment, haircuts, uh, prescriptions, whatever the case may be, right? They knew that they had um, trans reliable transportation um, organized with the Adirondack experience. Um, I'll then kind of fast forward. Uh, that was last summer. It was a phenomenal experience. Um, Earlier this year, they launched um, a virtual series um, called Black in the Adirondacks. Um, and it was really meant to engage community leaders of color um, and share their experiences, and not just community leaders of color, um, but community members of color, um, to really engage in their experiences in the Adirondacks. Um, there was a Driving Well Black series, part one and two. Um, and then really just, uh, addressing the history. So very much like um, this series where we're talking about community engagement, we're talking about that history um, and really providing that um, two-way communication with community members and organizations. And I think it's been a phenomenal experience um, in the sense that um, this is a nonprofit museum. It's an attraction, it's a destination um, that is really making a movement, that is really making um, some serious headway in, in social justice areas. And the fact that they, you know, they are not afraid to state that Black Lives Matter is critical. Um, you know, I think when it comes to tourism, we've taken a very strong stance with COVID. We were very reactive. We were, you know, we implemented all of our policies, we adapted, um, but we've been very quiet when it comes to Black Lives Matter. And so I think the time where before we may have been cautious to what uh, that if racism was a political um, theme or not, um, we're way past that. And I think as we look towards different markets, that is going to be critical. That intentionality is going to be key. Great. Thank you very much, Cindy. Well said. Molly? Absolutely. Um, so there's a couple audience questions. And the first one I want to ask, I think just ties so well with what everybody was just saying about um, the importance of Cooperstown trying to be welcoming to non-white tourists is not just about marketing and tourism. It's also about addressing issues in our community. I think it goes very well with what Dietra was saying that something was going on in our community that had nothing to do with our, our marketing and our tourism efforts. And it still had a really unwelcoming um, you know, feeling that she got from that. Um, so what avenues are there for the tourist industry to collaborate with other institutions like our schools and churches to address issues of racial inequality and racism? So anyone, anyone want to take that? Just, <laughs> yeah, just step in. I'm not sure that there's anything that currently exists uh, to do that. It's a great idea. Um, and that sounds sort of like a coalition to continue dialogue of what we're talking about now and to get more involved uh, with more people, a broader audience, uh, a broader reach. But today I'm not aware, uh, there certainly may be, somebody may chime in, but I, I don't think there is anything that does that. 
I think everyone's in a silo. I mean, I think hotel guys talk to hotel guys and churches talk to churches and whatever, but I, I'm not sure that uh, it's a, a broader, broader arrangement. I do think, however, though, that, you know, internships are great opportunities, um, as are um, management training programs. Um, these are great opportunities to work with our um, school systems, specifically our junior high schools, our high schools, um, to really just create that talent, source that talent, um, and then, you know, also reduce brain drain, right? So try to provide opportunities for um, our youth. But there are certainly great opportunities, summer internship programs, um, experiential learning programs um, that can certainly be um, created um, with certain, uh, not with certain, uh, with different destinations, um, uh, hotels, and, uh, and so on. You know, Molly, I think that's very, um, it's, a, it's a challenging question, you know, that was posed. And um, I think that there are, you know, challenges um, uh, that would um, be definitely something to consider in terms of how do you bring a community together to have a community conversation, right? I think that there are things that we can do to kind of, you know, uh, implement, you know, um, perhaps uh, next steps are getting better, but how do you do that as a community? Um, as Jim said, you know, there are silos and we are comfortable in our silos, right? So there's value in silos because we're comfortable there, we speak up there, we share there, right? So how do you infiltrate the silo so that you can also be a part of that conversation? It takes bravery on both parts, right? You have to be willing to let me in and I have to be courageous enough to want to show up. It's very challenging. I don't believe that this is all going to happen in a very academic way or in an institutional way. I don't think that this is going to happen with, uh, you know, all the best laws in the world because that's only fueled by, you know, my heart. There's someone, you know, that gets to make the decision you know, whatever the law says, someone still makes the decision and implement how it's going to happen. It really is neighbor to neighbor, right? Person to person. So how do you, you know, create that when we are customarily, you know, in silos, but yet we're faced with this situation and the world is saying, let's talk about racism. Let's do something about racism, right? And everybody wants to do something about racism, but we just still don't know how to like have a cup of coffee together, right? So how many panels like this are happening? I can't even keep up. I, I just can't keep up. How do I deal with it? I just show up. If I get a phone call, you know, you, you wanna have the conversation, you need to have a conversation. I'll, I just make myself available as much as I can to support people who want to have these conversations. Coming together as a community, it's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge. Definitely. And I think what you're saying in terms of silos, even um, the panel series we're doing, we're doing these sort of silos. This is specifically about tourism. We have another about education. We have another about healthcare. We have another about law enforcement, which is really important to kind of understand the issues in each silo um, and get everybody on the same page. But I think that just lends to the fact that it would be great to then have sort of further steps for the community as a whole after maybe everyone sort of brought up to speed on their in their silo, you know, to come up with some concrete things we can do. Um, one person said, uh, really great insights from your guests tonight. How can we bring this conversation forward a bit more? Could there be follow up with some concrete ideas, ways that small businesses can identify signage, visual marketing that is representative of a diverse audience, etc. Um, there's also another question. Um, should more Main Street businesses be public about their stance on racial inequality? And it says this is for everyone. I, I'll take a shot at this. I think it's, again, those are words. I, I think it's, you know, we say a lot of words at the right time for the moment. I think it's your actions. I think it's your behavior, it's how you treat people from the time they walk in, you know, the halls, of, in the Hall of Fame and the museum 
to the time they, they finish? How are they treated by our visitor services people or anybody else they run into? I mean, that's what you remember. I don't, signs and, and statements are, are nice, but you remember how you're treated as an individual, not words on a wall when all said and done. And I mean, Dietra, you, you had an experience. It's, it, it's something that stayed with you until you had another chance to go back to Cooperstown and, and had a better experience. Um, I just think that we're surrounded by people throwing, whether it's, you know, Twitter and statements and putting things out. And when, when you know, all of our unrest started, I mean, I, I don't know that you can remember the first 10 companies that put out a great statement or who the top 10 were. I mean, at the end of the day, every, there was a rush to do that. But what's the follow up? And the follow up is your behavior over the course of your existence and moving forward. And that's what people that's what people remember. So, you know, whether you're, everybody in Main Street put out a welcome sign, everyone welcome, it's nice. But then you have to back up those words with the actions. And I, I think that that comes from everybody. One hundred percent. I think it's a combination of both. Um, you know, you're right. Um, words are just words. You have to back those up with actions and not just because it's, you know, in the media, not just because we're um, finally shedding light to this, uh, to these issues, but really long standing. Um, but I will say this, that symbolism goes a long way as well. Um, so I know for a fact that um, social causes are very um, important to me and where I invest my money. So if I see a Black Lives Matter sign um, in a shop, of course I'm gonna go and I'm gonna support the shop. Um, so I think it's a combination of both. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Molly, we have time for maybe uh, one more question, I think, and we're starting to run out of time, I think. Maybe two more okay. questions. Sure. Um, let's see. Okay, there's, um, here's another one. Um, I witnessed a bad exchange between a dark skinned individual who was trying to conduct some business at the post office. The post office staff person was unhelpful to this foreign individual and brusque. To be more, wel to be more welcoming to a diverse community, all workers who make up our community infrastructure might benefit from appropriate diversity training. Who could or would provide that? Anybody have any ideas on that? <laughs> A really good mom to say, son, <laughs> daughter, that is just not appropriate behavior. <laughs> um, and I say that because oftentimes we think that we have to, you know, bring all these experts in, you know, to really kind of have uh, these conversations when really it, it could be a colleague to colleague. Like I witnessed that behavior, you know, and, you know, I didn't feel so good about it and just share why you didn't feel good, good about it take it to the HR person. I witnessed this behavior, you know, I, I, you know, what can, you know, be done about it. Everyone has power to do something and you don't need to bring in the expert or the stranger all the time. You just need to figure out what's happening within your company. Staff need to be comfortable with talking to each other about what they observe or what they feel that's uncomfortable going to that HR person, and that HR person should be someone who is, you know, objective enough, who's knowledgeable enough to be able to handle those situations. So I think, you know, we're getting so big and, and, and not that I'm, you know, discounting all of the efforts, but we are really not looking at what do we have right here in my own house? Like, what can I do like right here, right now? It's so simple, you know? So start simple first, identify what you have in-house and then if it's so bad and it's out of your control, you can't do anything, then you might want to go out and say, oh, we just, we need some, you know, training overall, you know, here. You know, it could be you as a CEO just having a very frank conversation with your staff. Like, here's what I'm thinking today. And be prepared for their reactions, right? Some of them you won't like, right? And some of them you're going to say, that's wonderful. But you discriminate there either right? Everyone deserves to be honored with what they're thinking and what they're feeling because everyone has a right to learn and change. And we can't dictate when that happens. We can only support, you know, good change. We can support it, but you can't dictate when or if, right? But we all deserve to be valued, right, as human beings, no matter what. 
Thank you. Thank you, teacher. Molly, do we have, uh, let me see if we've got, oh, we're, we're just about a minute away from, from finishing. So I think we're gonna, it's probably a, a fantastic way to, to end things. Um, we had um, about 50 people on the attending the call, and I thank you all for for joining us. And uh, to our panelists, um, greatly appreciated. Uh, I want to thank um, our uh, both the, the, all the panelists and our uh, my co-moderator Molly. Thank you very much for doing a great job. The Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown, Looking in the Mirror Committee. Uh, all uh, have made this possible, the Friends of the Village Library of Cooperstown Board and the Village Library of Cooperstown Board were all instrumental in making this possible. Just want to mention that our next event is on October 15, which is uh, Cooperstown Reflects on Racism in Education. Uh, and uh, we'll have Cooperstown Reflects on Racism in Healthcare on October 28. That rounds out our fall series and then in January and February 2021, Amalia had mentioned we will be uh, discussing law enforcement as well as housing and historic preservation, culture and the arts. And then we're gonna have a final session about taking action, what things can we do um, and, and you know, break, break those, uh, get, go across those silos as, as uh, have been brought up. But please, you know, there's a lot of actions that we can take as individuals as well as um, steps within your organization, you know, don't don't wait until uh, uh, February 2021 <laughs> to start doing them. But uh, some of these ideas have been fantastic, and I want to thank everybody uh, for helping out. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, um, if you can email, you can email FOVL. That's Friends of the Village Library. Library FOVL Friends 22 Main at gmail.com. That'll be the uh, uh, any follow-up email or questions that you have. So again, thank you very much everybody for taking part and uh, we'll hopefully see you in a couple weeks. <laughs>